Greetings, everybody. Welcome to Elder Goblin Games. Today we have Nathan with us from Tabletop Family or Family Tabletop. It's either Tabletop Family or Family Tabletop. I can never remember, so I... Either way, yeah, it, well, I'm fine you'll find either. it. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. So um, do, we have a, do we have a topic we want to start off with, or did you have something you wanted to, you know, go off um, of to, to get things rolling? Yes, I do have a topic. And um, you, you... Okay. Okay, I'm just going to go with it, and I'm not going to give a disclaimer for it. So you, right now you're in the middle of a of a, a very difficult like life tragedy, right? And I had like a like a little light bulb light bulb moment in my mind thinking about like, oh my goodness, like this guy's going through something really serious, but he's still making YouTube videos about tabletop RPGs, right? And so then I kind of put that on a scale and I'm going, all right, real serious life event, still found time to do tabletop RPGs. And I'm like, okay, so this this might be something that this person, um, not like a coping mechanism, but this might be this this person's way of relaxing or or finding enjoyment in life, like in a real serious way. Like, there's probably people who um, tangentially or topically jump into board gaming or tabletop gaming and stuff, but when something happens in life, they're like, eh, moving on, right? Like, like, yeah. but you you're not. And so there was an interesting thought where I was like, oh, not only are you thinking about which game books to bring with you in an emergency like system, like these were these were among your your like, you know, your family photo albums, essentially. Right. Like you were, you were bringing these things out as they're important. And then not only that, but you're going, hey, let me see if I can get mom and dad and my brother in law and, you know, and them playing. Right. And I was like, wow, that's that's really interesting because they're all going through a bit of a struggle right now. And you're finding a way to connect your family with tabletop role-playing games. Yeah. And so I didn't have like a direct question, but I was just wondering if you could talk about that and like, and maybe I'll press you to push in certain areas, but I just wanted you to talk about that idea. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. So, okay. yeah, I mean, tabletop gaming as a hobby is always, I mean, ever since, so I got into it, I'll just start by saying probably about, nine years ago, I want to say, um, literally a year after D&D 5e came out. Um, I just kept hearing about it. I, you know, I had tried to play when I was really, really young, and for whatever reason, we just couldn't figure it out. This was probably third edition, and we were all in middle mm -hmm. school at the time, so my friends and I, we would just look at sat blocks and try to figure out how to play this game. We had no idea what we were doing, and then when I finally got into it in my I guess that'd be my mid twenties. Uh, it was just a an eye opening experience for me that there were these games that you could put so much creative energy into. They were social, you know. Nobody was at the time looking at their phones or a screen or anything like that. That wasn't even an yeah. option back then. Um, it, and there was something about the connectivity of it that really just grabbed me and, and made me realize like. This is a sort of medium unlike anything else that exists. You know, I, I played mm. video games all my life. I grew up with them. But to answer your question, they just grabbed me in a way that nothing else really has. Like books, mm. movies, TV, whatever, video games. And so I just really gravitated to them. I mean, it, honestly, it took over a few years of my life. I, I started playing... Pathfinder, which is probably going to surprise some people out there, because uh, I never talk about Pathfinder just because that of was the your complexity. First, that was Pathfinder was your first game. Yeah, yeah, three three point five D and D basically, but uh, mm, Pathfinder okay. had a the the game shop in my town had a Pathfinder Society, which is like their organized play. Mm. And so I really got into that for a while. Uh, I would go pretty much two three times a week, even just whenever games oh, were wow. happening. I, it, wow. I will, yeah. full disclosure, this came after like a really big relationship breakup in my life. So it was like sort of a, I had nothing going on. You know, I was a single uh -oh. dude, didn't have a family sure. and really didn't even have family nearby at that point. And, uh, just really <laughs> dove into gaming like head first. And, um, mm. I guess to, to move back forward a bit to everything that's been going on, there are friends that I now have that I've had for years that I really only met through tabletop gaming. 
um, people that have been close in my life. Um, and, and it's just been such a staple in my life since nine years ago. So, mm -hmm. you know, every Wednesday, sometimes every other weeks, other times, you know, when we couldn't figure out a time to meet things like that, but it's, it's always mm -hmm. been this solid part of my life that I always gravitated back towards something to look forward to, um, somewhere to pour creative energy when I had no other outlet, you know, whether it was, mm -hmm. you know, cause I, I, I do music. Um, I've been trying to write a book for a long time. I even started to develop my own role playing game, but even in those times when I didn't have those things going on, you know, I could always lean on D and D or whatever system we were playing and knowing that that was just around the corner and I'd have it, you know, it's my poker night, basically. Like some people have sports, mm. I have D and D. <laughs> so yeah, that mm. was a long rambly answer, but, um, hopefully that no, that's, uh, that's you. So what you, what you have laid out and you, you can tell me if I'm understanding this correct, like, um, tabletop games became a way for you to like maybe relearn how to connect with people because you, you played a lot of video games and, and you know, video games are, are one of those things where it's like, you're either playing Tekken, you know, like with a person or World of Warcraft, or you're probably playing like Mass Effect or something like on your own. And like the people who are really enmeshed in the video game uh, arena are doing like one of a couple different things, but they're generally doing one of those couple different things, right? Like it's, it's, it's usually, I don't want to say it's all or nothing, but the, the Mass Effect people may not all be the, the World of Warcraft people. And so tabletop role-playing games became a way for you to like become social and it also like followed up as you said like after a breakup so there was the ability for you to connect with other people while you were hurting is that is that accurate yeah i i think so you know it it was also <laughs> like i've always been a huge nerd my whole life you sure, know, sure. It, it first it was magic the gathering or pokemon or whatever was the craze of the time um okay but then I, for whatever reason, I was always hesitant to to go into the D and D realm. I, I don't really have a reason why, other than maybe like no, the, I, the satanic panic was a big deal in my town, uh, where I grew sure. up. It was, it was a small town, um, yeah. so you know we weren't allowed. Really, I wasn't even allowed to play magic, but mm. we got away with it sometimes anyway. Which, sorry, I, I, mom and dad, if you're watching. I know, I understand what you mean because okay, I did the same thing. Like I, I was in college and I was hanging out with like a LARPing group, you know, like, like we were hitting each other with foam swords and stuff and playing like, I don't know, Arthurian Knights. And when people were like, Hey, you want to come play D and D? And I'm like, I'm not a freaking nerd. You know? I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Like it was that incongruent in me that I was like, I can play a LARPing game and have pretend fighting, but you guys rolling dice are, are stupid. Right? Like it was, I don't know. It's like a higher. Ones. Right, right, right. There was some sort of hierarchy of, of nerddom where I had determined that people who roll dice to determine the outcome of their, I don't know, it, well, I know. Here's, it's, a, here's a great example. Like I was always in band and for some reason, even when you were in band, the, the lowest of the social rung, you still got to make a, fun of people in flags for some reason that would, you know, run around <laughs> on the field. But sure, it, sure. There's, there's no reason really. I mean, we were nerds too, so, but yeah. Right. Right, and, and I think that that, that that was so. My first game in was third edition, and it was like in two thousand one or two or three or something. I don't remember the exact year, but someone invited me to their game group, and I was like, "Sure, I'll try it out." And I think I was playing Oblivion at the time. Like that was like one of my number one games was Oblivion. Yeah. And I came home after like my first game session where we got in a fight, we shot some stuff, we were breaking into a castle. And like I turned on my game and I was just like, I hate it. You know, I mean like yeah. it was this it was this stark difference between I can do what I can conceptualize versus I can do what the programmers conceptualized for me to do. And and it it like it broke games for me for like a long yeah. time. You know, yeah, sure. in, you in start, a good way. You start to always see the barriers once you're playing, you know, even you can only go so far in Oblivion right. before you hit those right. invisible walls that you know, or even just role playing things like that, you know. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Go going from picking four options in a conversation to going, I'm going to shoot this guy, right? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a real stark difference. And then, like, my first 
I, mean, I think my first three or four characters all died horribly because I played a really impulsive character each time. And that was also something where, like, I, I'm thankful my DM was a punishing DM because I learned to love those characters that died. And I remembered the ones that died, like any of the ones that lived through a campaign. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know them, you know, right, but like, yeah. I remember my first guy touched an orb of annihilation. Cause you want to see what it was. <laughs> and my DM's like, I, I got, I got to talk with you. I got to talk with you. <laughs> you know, and I was like, I, was like ah, I died. And he's like, yeah, you, you died. You did. We'll make a new character next week. But I, I appreciated playing that way because there was a finality to those characters. Yeah. And it, it made me appreciate the game system and the realism of the setting too. You know, yeah. which, which yeah. I mean, actually might lead us to some of the games you mentioned in your video, but I wanted you to keep talking. Have you gotten a chance to get a game going with your family or have you brought it up to them? Like, I mean, yeah, I you, know, was, especially, especially if you mentioned Satanic Panic. Like, like, are your parents uh, Christian or religious or something? They are. Um, yeah, my my mm -hmm. dad was a, a pastor for most of my life. And it, funny mm -hmm. enough, it's my mom that I think has the more aversion to gaming, especially D and D things like that. But mm -hmm. yeah, um, I mentioned it to them. I, I kind of softball pitched it, um, just to see their reaction. And, you know, because of just the strange situation we are in and the way that we're mm -hmm. kind of just around each other right now for so much time with not a lot to do while we're figuring out, you know, what to even do next. Um, I was like, Hey, you know, there's no better way to kind of get our minds off of things, spend some quality time together, do something creative and really fun. I, you know, I, I sort of told him it's kind of like a board game, but you're going to be a little more involved than that. And it's a little more free form <laughs> is how I pitched it. And they seemed to be, you know, um, amiable to the idea. Um, once I start breaking out the character sheets, we'll see how it goes. But uh, we have a game coming up and I think, I've been trying to decide what to even run for them. And I, I have Waking of Willoughby Hall with me. So mm -hmm. I, think I may try to do like a shadow dark hack of that and mm -hmm. see how that goes. And if, if they find it fun, we'll go from there. If not, I'm not going to even worry about session two or whatever, that kind of a sure. thing. Sure. Sure. I, I understand that. Like, I understand that thing kind of where your parents are coming from. I, I, I'm a Christian. It's, it's, it's on my channel. It's like, it's not a secret. And I went through a fundamental period, like just last year, you know, like I, I had this thing where I'm like, Ooh, can a Christian play Dungeons and Dragons? You know, sure. I'm like going through the, the, the DM book and I'm like, there's a whole page on demons here. You know, and it's like, they're like leaping off the page at me. And, and I, you know, it, over the course of the year, like the nightly game group that we have, the Saturday night game group that we had went from being like my son, my wife, myself, and our friend in Thailand to including my son's mom, my ex-wife, and my ex-brother-in-law. And at some point, like I had this thing, like, cause you know, my mom's pretty fundamentalist and she's like, I don't know how you're playing D and D and being a Christian. Right. And I was like, me neither, but it's working so far. Right. And, <laughs> and then like this, like, our game group started coming together and like you know we're, we're we're there and we're having fun fighting monsters and having just silly antics and stuff and in the background of my mind i'm going like wow i'm not even trying to summon any demons like i'm not even like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, i know that sounds silly like but that was the thing is like nothing in this is me trying to summon demons yeah i'm i'm trying to i'm trying to like as the dungeon master i'm trying to help my son connect with his mom they don't really have any interests yeah. you know and now they're painting miniatures and listening to dungeon dudes together and i'm trying to reconnect with my ex-wife and i'm trying to connect with my friend in thailand and now he's got a game that he's excited to play on saturdays because he's like alone out there he's been out there for like six years and i'm like i don't know anything about summoning demons but that is absolutely not my intention i think a christian can play this thing and that was like the end of it that was like that was like the end of my thing and like I still go to the game store and I look at the Mork Borg book and I'm like, all right, look, it, it's edgy. It's totally edgelordy. Yeah. I can tell trying to irk some Christians. <laughs> but when I look at that book as a Christian, I'm like, this is more affirming to me that Christianity is a real religion. Because, like, look, there's people picking on it. And I'm like, it's not offending me. The, the font choices offend me because it feels like reading the openings text crawl from uh, seven where it's changing fonts so many oh, times, yeah. but like it's, it's all over the place. 
Right, but I'm like, but the content, I'm like, I, I played Pirate Borg. Same thing, didn't summon any demons, wasn't even trying. I was just being a crazy pirate. And so I'm like, I, I understand the thing that the fundamentalists or the worried Christians are upset about. But at the same time, I, I, I perceive it as like a misconstrued sense of theology or something. And I, I'm like, I don't mean to be like contentious with other Christians, but for me, it was like, no, this, there are things in my life that my conscience has been afflicted by. And this was not one of them. Sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So yeah, just, just to kind of affirm what you're saying here, uh, shout out to the dungeon minister. There's a guy I follow who's like, he's a, I want to say he's an Anglican priest. And I think I've seen, he wears he a little a white channel. collar. Yeah. Yeah. He has a whole channel where he just talks about D and D. So there are yeah. people out there that, you know, are, are willing to push down some barriers and, and enjoy gaming for what it is. And uh, sure. uh, two, I will say, my sort of argument to my mom, because like, even when we were kids, it was more like Magic the Gathering for us. We, we mm -hmm. didn't, like I said, we weren't ready to step into the realm of D&D. &D. But even mm -hmm. that game, you know, it's, it's the same company, actually. It's, it's Wizards of the Coast, so it's got demons, it's got whatever in it. And I remember having a moment with my mom and being like, Mom, we live in a small town. Half of my friends are just really into drugs and substance abuse of some kind. And we're choosing to spend our time inside playing a card game mm -hmm. together. Like we could be wow. doing so many things. And <laughs> well, well done. Well done. I mean, that's that's that is a really good comparison contrast. Yeah. Right. That's so, really yeah. And what, and what did your mom say? She, that was the point. That was kind of a turning point for her when she was a mm -hmm. little more lenient on letting us, you know, delve into like fantasy type things. Um, sure. and, and she knew that the, the kids I was hanging out with at the time, they were good kids and, you know, none of us were doing anything nefarious by owning magic cards, uh, just cause they're spells and things like that. But yeah, that was a, sure. that was a barrier for me originally to even getting into D and D. So yeah, it, it was, and you think that might've been, oh, you, you, you think that you think that might've been the reason why it took you like so long to get, um, into tabletop role playing games in general. My my sense is you think that this is something you probably would have liked when you were a kid as well, like when you were younger. Yeah, no, it was a let me switch years here. It was definitely a okay. factor. Um, mm -hmm. I think I was hesitant to sort of go against their wishes for a really long time, and so I just mm -hmm. I it, it didn't even really occur to me. I was like, I've got enough nerdy hobbies, whatever I can sustain mm -hmm. off of, but I didn't even really know or quite understand what Dungeons and Dragons was. I think until I had played games like World of Warcraft and I started mm. to see like, okay, this is what people are saying when they say classes, you know, mm. uh, they're going into dungeons and you're fighting monsters and things like that. It started to click a little bit more in my brain. And then I just had an opportunity where I found out about a store in my town that had all these board games and stuff. And I literally like walked upstairs, saw a bunch of people sitting around tables. And I was like, Hey, is this D and D? And they were like, well, it's Pathfinder. So basically, mm -hmm. do you want to play? Yeah. And I was like, why not? Let's do it. <laughs> really? Let's roll a character. It was, yeah. it was, that, yep. it was that sudden. Wow. Yeah. I, okay, so I actually, I'm glad you came back around to that. Because, okay, what do you think was different about, like, when you were trying to learn Dungeons and Dragons versus when you then went back and tried to learn Pathfinder? Because I've I've heard, and I haven't looked enough into Pathfinder to know whether it's true or not, but I've heard Pathfinder is even more complex and crunchy than Dungeons & Dragons. And so if Dungeons & Dragons was hard for you, how is, I mean, like, can you, can you make it make sense? Like, how were you able to learn Pathfinder? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's just, it was age. I, I, this was years later. Um, okay. All right. I, I was in middle school whenever my oh, buddy okay. Chris had the... Uh, I don't think he'll care if I shout him out. When when Chris had his 3.5 edition monster manual, and really yeah. we, were, we would just look through the monster manual. We see all these stat blocks. We tried to interpret what the game was based on the monster stat blocks. And we even had like mm -hmm. a couple little battles, like mock mm -hmm. battles we did against each other. And that's all we knew about D&D. &D. And this was like mm. sixth grade for me. So I was, you know, okay. pretty young. And, and then later in my 20s, is when I just walked in and decided to play Pathfinder. But I also had okay. it pitched to me at the time because um, I think 5e had been out for a year at this time. Mm. And so I was like, why would I, what would I choose? Why would I choose Pathfinder 
over this sort of established name of D and D. Cause I didn't know about either of them really. And the yeah. guy at the store basically said, Pathfinder is just D and D with more bells and whistles. You have more options, more customization, a little bit more finicky rules. And at the time, you know, I had mostly, most of my experience with like game mechanics was magic, the gathering. So I was like, why would you not want more options? That sounds great. Oh, it, sure. And, sure. You know, not knowing what I know now, years later as a DM or GM, I, now I would never pick the game that has like way, way more options. Cause I'm, I'm definitely a less is more kind of a game master where I, that, mm. which is why I've enjoyed games like shadow dark. Cause I think it mm -hmm. has just enough of the rules to get you going, but leaves room for the GM to make interpretation. Mm. Whereas like Pathfinder has so many corner case specific rules that it almost like hampers play at the table, in my opinion, because okay. you spend so much time referencing. You're just flipping through the book mm. going, okay, I know there's a rule for if you're grappling a creature who's two sizes larger than you, but I can't remember it right now. So let's look it up. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, whereas I would just say you have disadvantage and that's so much mm. easier. Sure. You know, right. The, the, the rules over rulings, uh, yes. it, it, it works at a table where your players will allow you to adjudicate in the case of someone not knowing. It does not work if you have any war gamers at your table like if you have any war gamers, and i have i have i have one war gamer who makes my game miserable like we had an example in our last shadow dark game where like for narrative reasons i'm like this monster is going to do these two things and he's like it's not allowed to and i'm like but it's going to and he's like but i know the rule you know he's like he's doing this thing where i'm like look it's gonna run here it's gonna knock this guy 15 feet back and he's like he knows i'm cheating because technically I'm cheating, you know? Well, that's that's when and, you just say, it's an elite and he has two initiatives. So he goes twice. <laughs> right, right, well, that's but, the thing. So it's, it's, it's hard when you're playing with a player who is perceiving the game like a war game and they're going, yeah. it's you versus us. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a really difficult situation because that means that when that player sees you do a thing that seems a little unfair, they tend towards thinking that you're trying to you're trying to guide the game by unfairness or something, and, and as opposed to they're going, oh, this is for story purposes or something like that. They're not they're not interpreting this this um, this unfair moment as an opportunity for them to really shine. Like, hey, you just presented us with a Goliath. That's not fair, right? But it's like, no. But now you can have this really cool moment where you take down a dragon or something. And so it's it's hard to have that. But yeah, I get what you mean. So the the Pathfinder system, you, how long did you play that before you went, this is it for me? Probably a year and a half. Okay. I mean, and so you, you were playing, in it. Uh, you were playing as a player the whole time or you were doing DMing as well? Just as a player, I tried, I was prepping. So this is, this was actually my breaking point. Uh, I was mm. prepping for a game to run like a campaign in Pathfinder and I was coming up with the villain, the main big bad, whatever. And I'm literally building like a 20th level character because in that game, you have to do a feat tree. So you're like, okay, um, if he's an archer and he has twin shot, well then also, you know, I got to take it next level. He gets another feat because he gets a feat every two mm -hmm. levels. And so I'm building mm -hmm. out this character and I'm spending so much time on one monster. I mean, I'm talking like mm -hmm. an hour to create this one guy for a fight who may die in the yeah. first round for all I know. And so sure. that when I that's when I was like, man, I don't know if this is the system I want to run. I know my sort of mm -hmm. own brain capacity for, you know, my, sure. my, ability to process in the moment. And I was just like, this game is a lot of rules and, and they're really mm. finicky rules, really, you know, really granular. So I, in, in the way that- Quite the, question. Mm -hmm. but So what you were describing sounds like you were do, going through the process of making a player character, but as an NPC, is that how you make monsters? And so basically if, if you're playing Pathfinder and you're making a, an NPC who's an archer, you're basically making a player character to fight against player characters. Is that is that correct? Or if if you want to get really customizable with it, so like think okay. of it like um, you know you played Five E. If you've ever mm -hmm. used a spellcaster in Five E, right? 
No, I'm good. Oh. Yeah, see, there it is. There it <laughs> oh. is. I don't even have to I say like, anymore. All the cards out. Like, I don't know how to read, like, all these illusions. What's greater illusion? Oh. And then you're yeah. making choices like, what spell do I think is optimal for them to use in this moment against a party or whatever? So it's that, but, like, times 10, because really you, mm. you almost have to actually, like, build out a, a player character, at least first edition. Um, I don't know sure. about Pathfinder 2nd edition. I've only been a player in it. Okay. I never tried to run it, but yeah, so you, as just... the DM, might be running five, six, or seven unique player characters against your party of player characters, and so each one of them is running one person, and you're running like a few. If they're a humanoid in that game, if they're okay. like a humanoid, like an orc, a bugbear, whatever, yeah. sure, then sure. yes. It, they were mm. very similar to the way that okay. your characters were built. I mean, you were pulling from like basically a different book of feats and things like that. They were more sure. mon monster centric, but the impression I walked away with was I just don't have the time to sink into this. Okay. It was just sure. not, uh, not streamlined in my opinion. Mm. But third edition, third edition isn't really about being streamlined to be fair. Uh, it, it is about the complexity. It's it's for people who lean into that. But I just realized okay. that wasn't for me. Uh, and that was when mm. I checked out 5th edition. Because I had a friend who was running it. Oh, okay. And I got to play in one of his games. And I was like, wow, compared to 1st edition Pathfinder, this feels so easy. Which Really? Which is saying something. This this is also yeah no like was this was this fifth edition after Xanathar's and uh, Tasha's came out because those really messed with fifth edition. Like when Tasha's obviously we jumped in late, but when we got the Tasha's book, when I got to page seven and it basically just destroyed the entire reason why you'd ever pick a race. I was like, what is this? Is the whole first section of this other book just null and void now? Like I don't I don't understand. <laughs> Like, that was a really weird thing. I was like, wait, wait. So you can just make anyone and say, like, they're elf, sort of, you know? And, like, but really it's a dwarf with a constitution bonus. With like, And I was like, what is anything now? You know? Like, it was... Yeah. It was, it was, no, it was like, this, this was at the beginning of 5e when there were only the core okay. rule books. Um, I, honestly, it was, it was fairly streamlined back then. I, and I think this is something okay. that happens with every edition that, that stays around for a long time, is you start to get what they call bloat or rule bloat and power creep, mm -hmm. which, you know, I think it, it got kind of exponential after Tasha's in my opinion. Okay. Um, and yeah. that's kind of when I honestly started to look at other systems because, you know, mm -hmm. say what you will about the custom race or character creation kind of stuff. I, I'm glad it's there for the people that enjoy it, but sure. it's sort of, you know, it, that was the point when I had to start saying like, I don't know if we'll use this book, you know, and that, mm. that always feels like a weird line to draw for me. Yes, yes, yes. Hey, you can only put, okay, the Grognards all have that thing where they say, uh, in, in our game, you can play um, humans and elves, and no one can be a paladin or a cleric, right? And that's like the old the old way of doing it. Dude, I got like a table with 13-year-olds. I'm going to be like, <laughs> you got to pick this character. Like, my son tried to pull that with me yesterday. He's like, you got to be a dwarf. I'm like, I ain't being a dwarf. <laughs> I'm not going to yeah. do it. Just burst that bubble real quick. <laughs> Right, no, right. You, and, you know, at, at the beginning of when I started playing, I was kind of that way too, unfortunately. I was that, like, needlessly, I don't know, picky GM where I was being like, oh, yeah, like, I want a, a sort of Game of Thrones level of serious to my game. And so mm. there's not going to be any of these animal races and stuff like that, which I, mm. I quickly, you know, loosened my belt on because I was like, whatever, you know, have fun, play the things you want to play. But it, then it also just made me realize, like, maybe this isn't the system I want to run. Maybe it's just a mm. little too, I don't know, silly, for lack of a better word, for, for me. What, what, what did that for, for you? Um, and, and I want to I want to aim you in a direction, but I'll, I'll at least suggest what did it for me. Mm -hmm. um, we had a moment where one of our characters, one of our players' characters, like, had a heroic death. Right, a massively heroic death, grabbing onto an airship and like you know hulking out and and then pulling the airship down to the ground and crashing it onto themselves while killing a boss. Like it was a, it was an amazing moment. And all my players are trying to go run and find their body. I'm like they're dead, they're dead, they're dead. And they yeah. go, 
And but the thing is, they know all they need is a molecule of his DNA yep. to bring back for a 10,000 gold spell. And they know that if I don't let them, I have messed with them. Like I have cheated them out of it. And in actuality, that's true. And everyone can say like, oh, but you can just take resurrection out and punish my players, right? Like I, like I, have, to, I have to then become a, um, an, almost an antagonizing GM to some degree. Like if I'm playing in a system that has true resurrection, I'm like, this world doesn't have it. They kind of know from the onset that I have established the world as being this thing. And it's like, why not at that point just pick a system where there are no resurrection spells yeah. since those exist? That was that was kind of my, like, oh, they're not going to let this guy die, right? Yeah. And and if we can in this world, this guy doesn't die. And I'm like, I, I, I can't, I, I'm done. <laughs> you know, that was like, that was the moment for me. But I want to hear, I want to hear, what about your game became too silly? Well, so one of the main things is, we had a game that I ran for, I want to say two years. Uh, and we got to, I, I think it was level 16, which if you've ever played that high of level in fifth edition, you know, I was throwing, you know, world ending cosmic enemies at them session after session, because what could challenge them anymore when you have, you know, spells that can decimate a town, things like that. So you have like to the, three and four combats. Yeah. 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 Well, and so I would, I just got to the point where it was like, you know, we had a sort of like storyline that had developed through the game based on their choices. And I had this cosmic threat that was coming for them. But then, you know, it was like cosmic threat of the week where something else would <laughs> arrive before the thing got there. And, you know, it just got to the point where I was like, what am I doing but trying to create new monsters to challenge you in any way at all and then mm. on top of that i was sort of creating so many homebrew root homebrew rules that i was adding mm -hmm. to our game that it was barely mm. recognizable as fifth edition anymore example that sense. Um, yeah, ex example rule that you added oh man if, if if i had one of my players here they could probably tell you all the things i annoyed them with but like i took out um reactions I, I, oh. any, any spells that were reactions, I just took out. How come? Because uh, you have things like silvery barbs and counter uh -huh. spell, yep. and it, yeah. it just it got to this point. Like I had six players, you know, mm -hmm. combat in fifth okay. edition is not quick. Yeah. And no, with no. six players at level sixteen, like I had, I had the at the time, I think this was like the, oh, what do they call it? Un Unearthed Arcana Alchemist. Mm. So. Mm -hmm. It was like we were using D and D Beyond. Things were shifting every week. You know, my guy would just be like, "Hey, now I can create a little like portal bag where I could throw, mm. you know, a bomb through it at this beholder we're fighting." And then now the beholder's dead, and you know that took thirty <laughs> seconds. You know, <laughs> it was just stuff like that where I was just like, I can't even keep up. Like I would read their character yeah. sheets in between weeks and be like, "What are they capable of?" I'm not even sure. Um, I'm not even sure what to throw at them. Yeah. So I, yeah. I started having to like limit stuff and it, and it didn't feel good to me. I didn't want to be like, you know, this is the, the Jorben 3.0 edition, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, where now there are, yeah, now there are no reaction spells. It, it, I just hated taking stuff away, you know? Um, yeah. It just, it started to get too complicated to remember even. Tell me more about that, because I felt the same thing. But when I talk about this on my channel and I, and I ask a question about this, you know, like, for example, like the true resurrection or um, taking away certain magical abilities or spells or something like that, people people generally do this like, hey, it's your game. Do what you want. Like they have this attitude about it. Like, yeah, why wouldn't you do that? And my my thought about it is like it feels like playing in one of those um those server games, right? Like Minecraft or something. But I've created a server where it's like every time you get one block, you get half a block instead of one block or whatever. Like it feels <laughs> yeah. like one of those games where I have mitigated the system of resources to to the point where it's like okay, why don't I just be direct with you guys and say I kinda wanna make the game harder for you. Let's play in a hard game, as opposed to trying to I don't know, like as opposed to trying to salt this thing up to add some flavor, and it's like it's it's still it's it's still not going to come out. It's, it's going to be so hard to get this to be a hard game, you know, to be challenging to you guys. And it's like, 
I don't know. Like, tell, tell me what you what you what your thoughts on that are. Because, like, I keep hearing people go, like, just play it how you want, bro. And it's like, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, no, I mean, it's a good point. I, I do think some homebrew is fine. I You know, everybody mm-hmm. has just things they prefer. If you want to sure. alter some, maybe things that aren't, like, core parts of a game, I think that's totally fine. I, and I still do that. Even with Shadow Dark, I have my own little uh, rule set that I, you know. And that's that actually comes from, a, like, a long history of tradition. I watched a couple of videos where some of the early people who were involved in, in D&D were talking about how you would go to someone's house, and the first thing you would talk about were, what are your table rules? And it would be like, mm. okay, these are the things we changed to the core D&D game. So, you know. It's tradition. I think it's fine to do some. It's when you start mm-hmm. reaching into the like, uh, I've changed 40% of this game. That's mm. when I'm like, that's just, it's too much for your right. players to remember. It's too much for you to remember. You, you start mm-hmm. to enter a realm where you're like, we should just be playing a different game is what it is. Mm. And, and, and I, I think there's a line for everyone and it'll depend on you and your table. But I definitely know now better where mine is. And there are some things, too, that are like, like, okay, here's an example. Mm -hmm. So we're playing D&D 5th edition. I think that there are just certain expectations that people bring when they play a game like that. They're like, this is going to be heroic fantasy. We're going to be doing superhero level powers. We're probably never going to die. And if we do die, it's because we made some bad choices and got stuck in a bad situation. It's not because our DM, you know, is overbearing or whatever. So if you're like, okay, let's start off. I cut out, there's, you don't add your con to your level when you level up or whatever, you know, to your HP that you Mm -hmm. roll. And we're only rolling HP. You can't take the average. Then there's going to be someone at your table that's going to go, that's just not what I'm imagining for D and D. You know, that sounds more like a shadow dark or something. Mm. And so you're, you're, you have misrepresented adventure that they expected by mm. altering the the uh, pray that I do not alter them any further, right? Yeah, yeah. I get you. Okay, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an expectations thing because let's be real. D and D, as it stands, fifth edition at least. I don't know about twenty twenty four. Is is a beer and pretzels kind of game. Everyone's there to have fun. They're there to throw around their hero- heroic powers and intentionally get in fights. I think that's mm. what people are expecting now when they hear D and D. And so if you are like, this is going to be this really dark and gritty game, there are only humans. It's like already you're, you're like, you mm-hmm. ruined someone's idea of what D&D is probably. You right. Know? right. Maybe it's only one out of five of your players. Maybe you're lucky you have a great table and they're just okay with the game you want to run. But I think sure. certain games have certain expectations. So it's much easier to just say like, hey, we're going to play Shadow Dark, right? Mm. Immediately you're like, okay, you know, now I'm thinking of my characters as characters as hit points rather than mm. having hit points on my character. You know, I stuff see. like that. Sure, sure. Were yeah. hmm. it's so, okay. So, so were you DMing fifth edition with a group of people, and then you kind of went like, "Hey, we're gonna try a new system," or how how did that how did that go for you? Or like like what? What what were you in the middle of doing tabletop role playing wise when you started thinking maybe you like the the light games or the lighter rules games like how, what was what was that transition? So I didn't even really know what I was gonna like yet. I was just trying out a bunch of games at first. Um, I just knew I didn't want to run fifth edition anymore. And I think the thing that really set it in stone for me was I told my players, "Hey, I don't think I ever want to run past tenth level again. Maybe even fifth mm-hmm. level." And they were like. Mm-hmm. Ooh, fifth level. You can't even really build a character by fifth level. And I was like, well, maybe I just don't want to run D and D. Then you, you guys want to try something else. Mm-hmm. And they were really willing to, you know, try out a few games with me. And actually, this is probably also going to surprise some people if they hear this. The first game I tried that wasn't D and D was Genesis. I don't know if you've heard of that game. Oh, uh, it has its own dice set, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 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 the same one as the Fantasy Flight Star Wars game. If you've ever the Edge that. Edge Studios game, uh, Edge of the Empire what is it, one of them. Edge of the Empire. There we go. Yeah, yeah, Edge. So like Genesis is the system that the Star Wars Edge game uses. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Same okay. same okay. weird okay. dice, same mechanics and mm-hmm. stuff. And we played okay. that for I want to say about six months before 
Mm. I got tired of it. <laughs> it, oh, it got really oh. tedious to me. Um, what did, what did, yeah, what did, you, what did you get tired of? Because, I mean, I've had people recommend the, the system to me, like, hey, you should check out Genesis. And I, I just know that it's a system that you can play a multi-spectrum of settings within. But I don't know yeah. much more than that. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a universalist system, so you can you can play whatever weird West sci-fi fantasy. Um, I there were things I did really like about it. I'll tell you the one thing that eventually broke me. There are all these dice you're rolling, and they all have little different symbols and results. And you know <clears throat> you might have a result from a player. Let's say they made a history check, and it's like, mm -hmm. okay, you have. I'm going to get the butcher all the names on this because I can't remember. This is the other problem. I can't even remember them. It was like, okay, you got a triumph, which is kind of like a crit, but you also rolled a despair, which is like a crit fail. And you got two threat on this die over here. So that means your threat level for this roll is two. Oh, but wait, you also got two boons. Oh. So the okay. boons. So you, so, there's, so you as the GM are having to adjudicate some some random craziness and make sense of like a nonsense role and add something that's not disparate. Like, okay. All right. You go ahead. Keep explaining it, but that sounds awful already. Yeah. And there were, you know, some things cancel each other out, but like a despair and a triumph don't cancel each other out. So it's like <laughs> you fully succeeded and fully failed at the same time in this role. And now I have to interpret what oh. that means to this specific role. And uh -huh. sometimes it, you could do it and it made sense. And there were charts that were like, here's some suggestions. If you just want to have them okay. deal some strain or whatever and take some uh -huh. damage, you can do that. Sure. But here's kind of what each, it was just, it got so taxing. Uh, okay. It, it was sure. good for a certain style of campaign, I'm sure, but it wasn't really quite the transition I think I was looking for with my group. Uh, and okay. we ended up quickly moving on to DCC, but that's a whole... Another part of so the you, journey. You went, so you went from like one form of complexity to a new form of complexity, and that new form of complexity was less interesting for you to adjudicate as a as a DM, and you're like, you just nope, this isn't this like this is still complex but weird complex now or something. Yeah, yeah, and I I even think it wasn't necessarily worse. Um, okay, it was just different, and and the thing that really I think I was hitting bumping up against was that like. The game kind of pitched itself as this very simple narrative game uh, that mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of complexity to it. But when you even just look at the way the basic resolution works, you're like, that, that's really not that simple. You you have mm -hmm. six sort of different possible outcomes on every roll, you know, because it's like mm -hmm. crit fail, crit success, sure. uh, fail with a setback, success mm -hmm. with a bonus, or success with a setback. And mm. like I, I don't know, just all the combinations. And you're but you're rolling multiple dice, so you're getting multiple of those results. Yeah, I see that. Like, okay, that sounds very war gamey because like I we we talked a little bit before the stream and I asked you about if you play war games. You, you said no. Marvel Crisis Protocol and several of the war game systems that have unique dice like Shatterpoint work on those kind of things where like you roll dice and it's like here's a weird symbol, here's a weird symbol, here's a weird symbol. My character does these four things in this one attack. I think that works for a war game. I think that would be terrible <laughs> for for an RPG because, like, especially if the DM is the one who has to decide moment to moment what each of those things means. Like, if there's not a chart that tells me I can see three days into the future, but I, all my prophecies are false, you know, like, you know, like, yeah. ah, you know, like, if there's not a chart for it, like, ah, it's that's a that's a really that's finicky. I think I I, I eh, okay, I'm less Did interested in that system. You know, I will say it's a great game for someone. I, mm. I, I genuinely sure. think it's it's a very interesting game. And I actually think it works, for some reason, it works better for Star Wars than it does generic really? fantasy. It, it's got that sort of pulpy action feel to it because you can just go like, oh, the stormtrooper shot at you and he missed, but he hit the sign right above your head and now it's collapsing down on you. That kind of stuff. Okay. I don't know. It, it feels right for that style game. But I was just sure. doing like a sort of generic fantasy city crawl kind of a thing mm. and i yeah i just eventually the rub from the uh, you know having to adjudicate every and maybe i should have just mm. asked for less roles as part of it too maybe i should oh. let more things happen should, but sure but, you know people want to roll dice so 
and you're also coming from Pathfinder and Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition, and so it's like the that that transition from roll to see if you see stuff in the room to yeah, you see stuff in the room. It's it's there's a gradation there that takes time to adjust to because yeah. you're right. You get the sense that people show up to the table to roll dice. And the first time you go, yeah, you, you find some stuff. Uh, here's what you find. It feels like you have given away too much. Or, or it feels like you're not making it gamified enough to justify people sitting at the table with you. Like, well, I could have I could have decided myself I find some stuff. I don't need you to tell me, right? Like that that it it's a hard thing to transition into. And sure. and I've struggled with it at, at, at times because I'm like <sighs> um I don't know, you, you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, no, that's that's one of those sort of like OSR mentalities that I've adopted since I've you know, been trying out games like DCC, Shadow Dark, um, eventually OSE I want to try. But um, I, I think that shift in mindset is difficult when you're coming from games like Pathfinder and 5th uh, Edition because mm -hmm. a lot of people sink a lot of points into Perception, for instance, or they have yes. whole feats. Yeah centered around yeah. perception and being good at it. So you don't want to just say, uh, oh, hey, slow down. Don't roll that dice. You know? Yeah, yeah. It, it is a weird thing that you have to sort of transition into. But... Well, I've designed my character to be able to talk well, mm -hmm. and so I convinced this NPC to open the gate for me. I rolled a 23. And I'm like, well, what do you say? Well, I rolled a 23. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's like yeah, okay, but, bah. but what do you say? And then the moment you actually get the person to say something interesting to convince the NPC to do a thing, you no longer need to ask for roles. And so like charisma and, and persuasion and all those like charisma skills become very useless at a table where you're going, tell me what you say. Yeah. And so like, like the charismatic stat becomes something you can almost drop off. And I find that like in some systems, they're trying to wedge it into places where, I mean, okay, Shadow Dark does an okay job. Some people pointed out that you can like add charisma to enemies I don't know, their morale checks or something, or their ability to start earlier in the round or something like that, their initiative. And I'm like, okay, fine. Um, maybe that's a little wedged in. But otherwise, like, if you don't have the witch class or the, 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 the whatever the backwards paladin is um, in Shadow Dark, there's almost no reason for the charisma class or the charisma attribute mm, because a game where you're, where you're going, no, there's, there's no reason to roll to convince this goblin of something. Just say what you say, yeah. you know? And I, you, you know, to, ahead, to your ahead, point, uh, this was something I think Mouse Mouse Ritter actually kind of turned mm -hmm. the light bulb on in in my head because there's it's not so much a rule but like a I don't know a guideline it, and it says this is under the player's guideline I believe it says something like rolling dice is risky and should be avoided when possible so mm -hmm. that you're you're encouraged to role play in a way where you're not going to have to roll a dice. But again, it sure. is a, mind, a mindset shift. Um, oh, there's yeah. something else I was going to add. And now I'm, I'm gone off on a tangent. But yeah, um, to your point, I, I, I think that charisma is just always going to be on the page somewhere because it's tradition sure. at this point. Um, I, 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 even games that are more modern, I still see something akin to a charisma stat because I think we just... Mm. Some of us just want to roll it, right? There's still mm -hmm. gonna be that player at your table that's like, "Hey, man, I don't, I don't feel like talking like a goblin today and trying to figure out what <laughs> this guy wants. Can I just roll the die, and mm -hmm. we'll see what happens?" And that's fine, you know. Some people prefer sure. that, so I think it's always gonna be mm -hmm. in our games. But it is a point, a good point, to, that it's like it's some games it's barely usable, <laughs> you know. Have you so so if you? Let me jump into uh, asking you some questions about Shadow Dark because it's yeah. it's a system I'm playing as well, and compared to D and D, I'm like I'll take Shadow Dark every day of the week over D and D. Um, compared to Dragon Bane, I'm like on the fence about it because yeah. um, because of some of the setting things. And so actually, we were doing a stream last night, and a dude in our in our chat sent me over a four-page document that was called a campaign primer. And I'd never heard of this. I'd never heard of this thing before, and I'm like, all right, all right, whatever. And so he sent it over to me. He's like, and I was like, can I look at it? And so I look at it on the stream, and I'm going through it, and I'm like, 
trying to figure out what this document was and about one paragraph into this thing, because it, was, it wasn't like four pages of dense text. It was like four pages of broken down bullet points and stuff. He had basically like, a, here's what's going on in the world. If you pick a human or a halfling, you're basically part of the empire, okay? Um, if you pick an orc, uh, a goblin, an elf, or a whatever, a dwarf, you're part of the free peoples, you know, and so like, and, and so he, he had this world set up where if you picked an orc, you kind of knew what you were in the world, right? And yeah. you knew some of your history. And then there were factions. And I was like, oh, dang it. This is what I forgot to do. Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know really to do this. Because the problem I have it, have it at my table is, I mean, I could be wrong. Someone mentioned that the cursed scrolls have this type of stuff. I didn't see this in the gloaming, and I didn't see it in the, the, the Nordic one, whatever. So I could be wrong, but I just didn't notice this document in those pages when I was pulling stuff out. Um, but the point was, like, we're playing in a game right now, and, like, my son's friend, like, he's playing this, you know, this goblin. He just loses touch with it. He loses touch with who he's playing. He's playing a cleric, and he just gets bored. And so, you know, I'm, he, he talks with me. I'm like, yeah, we'll kill off your character. No worries. <laughs> and so he did it in an exciting way, and I let him make a new character before the session. So he... My son's uh, uncle, also kind of like, eh, detached, whatever. Like, I'm having a few players that are kind of going, and I'm going, oh, my goodness, that's what I didn't do. I didn't ground their characters in because we have people in places doing things that they don't quite know why they're invested in this thing in the way that they are. Yeah. And part of me is like, I'm, I got I to start over, right? Like, part of me is like, I need to actually detach my players from their characters have a recession zero, start over with this four player document and go, we're playing same world, same thing. You guys are different people on a different mission. But I'm like, that's a disruption on its own. I'm like, might as well just start a new system at this point. Like it's, but it's, it, well, okay, I, so I, the question- I don't think you have to go, go that far, go, but. <laughs> I, I know, but like, okay, there are some, okay. Um, I, wanna, I wanna put it back to you because I wanna see how you've solved this issue. Shadow Dark is a system that is similar to D&D &D in an opposite way. In Dungeons and Dragons, you can make a warrior that's casting spells. Like, anyone can kind of be everything. And since everyone can kind of be good at everything a little bit, to the point where, like, the dungeon dudes are making videos and being like, here's how you can have, like, a, a skills in everything, right? Like a 23 mm -hmm. in all your skills. Yeah. There's a way to make a class that's absolutely broken for skill checks and everything else. And it's like, all right, so everyone can be everything. In Shadow Dark, everyone is nothing. Like, everyone is kind of just a nobody. And, and okay, if you make a wizard in the Shadow Dark system, it doesn't say anything about that character, right? There's no reason that they weren't a fighter. And even to the point where, like, if you're playing a gauntlet, you're randomly determining what people level up into unless you're letting your players choose. So this person who was in this gauntlet mission to go on this, whatever, this, this voyage, let's say it's the, um, the Viking one. You go on this voyage to this place. Oh, look, you leveled up to one. Turns out you were a wizard, right? But, like, there's no reason it wasn't you were a warlocker. And so because of that, it means that that character has a lack of sense being grounded in the world. And I don't know how to solve it except by way of this document this guy sent me, right? Which is like... Yeah. Which then also makes it difficult to run a gauntlet for the game... And I also don't know what to do with that, because if I run a gauntlet for the game and suddenly, like, three people turn into wizards in this party, like, hey, this game system says magic is very rare, and, you know, like, and, but there's three people in this party that have it? You know, it's like, yeah. anyway, so tell me, you're, you tell me you're just, I'm going to be quiet now, you unload. <laughs> well, so I, I have two thoughts. Um, one is more about the class-specific stuff, and then the other is, like, sort of tying your players to the world. Because it sounds like the thing you're talking about is also sort of like a world-building tool a bit, if I'm yeah. interpreting it right. And yeah. I think I'm just at the point that I've played enough games that I I know I want to have, especially if it's a game with a high mortality rate, like Shadow Dark or mm -hmm. DCC or something with funnels, I probably sure. want to have like a faction or group that all these characters are coming yeah. from. Right. Mm. So that they're sort of tied together in a way that's outside of just your random farmers who survived a horrific mm. event. Um, so like that's, in, that's my mistake. Random farmer. I made I made a whole party of random farmers. Oh yeah, I did it in DCC. <laughs> but so yeah. you know, I've been kind of I was ramping up for a Shadow Dark game pre the 
Western North Carolina disasters. So I had written this entire group I called the Lamplighters. And it was going to be kind of a uh, West Marches style where they're branching out from a main city hub. So the idea was that you're going out into the world to sort of, you know, push back the darkness, to up, you know, empty out the old tombs and dungeons, to, to fight off bandits, things like that. That way, if some random character dies from a trap, they just send in a new lamplighter as a reinforcement. And so there's a way to kind of tie them into the world and the lore and the things that were happening in the game that felt a little more natural to me. But that's something you just, I think, learn as you play. But specific mm -hmm. to the, like, I leveled up and went from being a farmer, and now I'm a wizard somehow. Sure. You know, that's where you, you kind of just have to gamify it a little bit. Um, and, and maybe it's, you know, you get to the end of that session, and it's like, hey, well, when you guys were digging through that dungeon, Bob and Bill both found spell books at the end, and they started reading them, and it unlo unlocked the potential of their minds. But, you know, mm. there's you're going to have to suspend your disbelief in some way, no matter what, because it is yeah. a game at the end of the day. But I know what you're saying. It's, it, it is... It can be a little uh, unsatisfying to, to have it happen that way, especially if your players are really like narrative driven and they, they're bought into the lore. Like I, I have a player, my buddy Hunter, we were about to play this Shadow Dark game and he's, he's like, what's the world lore? Like, uh, what should I do for writing my background? And I was like, you shouldn't write a background. Mm -hmm. You might not even mm -hmm. live through this gauntlet. You know, we, <laughs> I, I don't want you to get attached to these characters. Because I have no idea what's going to happen, and I don't want it to be my fault that you wrote a three-paragraph story about your guy from the woods, and he dies when the first spear comes out of the wall at his neck or whatever. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It's it's different for every kind of player, and I know you have some power gamers at your table. I was watching one of your videos the other day. That was, I found it really interesting because I I too have some power gamers in my group, but um, yeah, it's. I, I think it's one of those things that's just not really going to have a really satisfying answer because, mm. you know, it's a game mechanic that's building mm. off of a different game mechanic where you're running a funnel, right? And then your mm -hmm. character levels up. Now you do have a class. Suddenly you're you're a fighter and you're good at all weapons out of nowhere. You were a baker before and suddenly you're right. skewering people with a rapier. Like, how did that happen sure. overnight? But. You know, and maybe you just pass some time in between and you can't kind of come up with a narrative reason that your characters are suddenly powerful. But I don't know, mm. that's, that's again, that's more of a story thing. So, it, yeah, it's, it, people are going to find different levels of acceptance with that sort of thing. So, um, let's see, have you played in systems with players that are similar to Shadow Dark? And what I mean by that is, players where the system is setting agnostic because um like let me be clear like shadow dark has a limited setting like it's kind of like hey everything's miserable and no one's happy here right um but it's it's also like there's no real specific way that a wizard has to work there's some open-endedness to this thing um and as well it's a little more difficult in Shadow Dark to make a character where let me see if I can if I can explain this well. Okay. In Dragonbane, there is a way to make a character by the time they're like level two, quote unquote level two, <clears throat> a character who has a unique funneling system in the game, right? Like my son made a character in Dragonbane. It was pretty interesting actually. It was a wizard who used a great club and channeled enchant weapon into a great club so that he's hitting with this great club and critting on a one, two, three, or four. So he's, he's critting like a, a, a fifth of the time, right? He's yeah. critting all the time. And so he was a, this was a character who could nearly two-shot a dragon, right? This is a character, like, at level two, people know them three towns over, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're talking about club, club brain guy, right? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Shadow, Dark, you, Shadow Dark, you can't build that kind of character. Yeah. Which is interesting on its own, but it, it means that your players might have some difficulty finding the unique aspect of their character unless you as the DM create that unique aspect with a world mm -hmm. setting. And if you don't create that world, like that, that unique aspect with a world setting and go, oh, 
in this world, mages are, you know, witch hunters or something. Like, you're all going to be witch hunters. And, you know, witches are going to be hunted by mages. Okay, and that's just my world setting. So if a witch and a wizard are in the same party, like, they're going to bicker, right? And, and so unless you do that as a DM, you basically have a party of just, like, random people that have gotten together, and your players may not know how to play their character. Does that, does that make sense? I think so. So if, if I'm hearing you right... Kind of what you're grappling with is, so in a lot of old school games, there's less customization, less ways to express yourself through the mechanics when you're building a character. Sure. Sure. And it's more dependent on the GM handing you things like tools or mm -hmm. magic equipment, things like that. Sure. Whereas a sure. game like Shadow Dark, maybe a more, let's call it like modern and, and player facing, or I'm sorry, not Shadow Dark, Dragon Bane. Dragon Bane, there we go. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It has a little bit more customization, so you might be able to sure. build a character out of the gate who can do at least one thing very, sure. very well that you know might yeah. make them stand out. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. it, it really does come down to preference and game mechanics at the end of the day, because mm -hmm. there are going to be some players they're totally fine with you know the Shadow Dark OSE kind of style or OSR style. Where it's like, sure. I'm fine with being a nobody, and we'll see what happens. It's called emergent play, I guess, is, is what I hear a lot of people use. Uh, explain that. I, I've heard of that, but I don't know what it is. Uh, what, is what is that? Emergent play is like your character develops through their actions and choices, rather than like the things they just get along the way because the game lets you build them, if that makes sense. Oh, I like, see. Like in a 5e Yeah. Family. I, maybe I'm wrong, so you, so you can to, call me out, but... Uh. So you have to be kind of a... <clears throat> so the emergent play style is like you manifesting your character through this avatar or whatever, this this character, and and you have to be a little bit good at role-playing to do it. Like, it might be harder for a new player to do that emergent type of gameplay. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, and and more so because like you're not given a lot of tools to customize your character. If if I'm understanding it right, yeah. um, because okay. it's like Bob started out as a farmer, Bob mm -hmm. found a pitchfork, and now he's a <laughs> polearm fighter because yeah. now he's he's killing sure. kobolds left and right with his his pitchfork. Yeah. Um, yeah. And his story sort of develops as he as you're going through these adventures, and making choices. Whereas like the five E sort of method is like. I built out a shadow knife. Uh, I can't even mm -hmm. think of the, the name of it. The, yeah, yeah, the, 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 like mind, psychic, the mind blade. Yeah, yeah the psychic you mind. You know where I was going. I teleport to my knife. Yeah, 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 I gotcha, yeah. And, and that is, right. that's, I, if I'm understanding, that's not emergent play because you are just building an idea. You're, you're theory crafting mm -hmm. your character and you're sort of explaining it through either mechanics or something you predetermined, uh, you know, mm. through the build. Whereas, like, over here, you're just like, these are things that happened based on my actions and the adventures we went through. Now I'm known as the Cobalt Slayer, Bob, okay. you know, who was once a farmer. Yes. But it, okay, it so... does probably require more, I don't know if experience is the right word, but just maybe a little bit more creativity from your players in order to do it that first way, that emergent way. Yeah. Have you... Uh, so... Yeah, I guess that's the that's the thing that okay. So, this thing we're talking about, like setting inside of a system, is kind of the reason that I've been recently getting like bumped around in Shadow Dark. Because like initially we were we were in, in in fifth edition and we're like trying to game, trying to game, and it was like, man, we're having a real fun time playing this game, but these combats three hours long, you know. Uh, th 30 minutes to get around the table with people going like, I don't, what do I, hold, hold, hang on a second, go back a second, I had silvery barbs ready, and it's like, ah, you know, yeah. there's all sorts of different things happening that took, just make it. That's why I took that spell out right there. <laughs> no, no, okay, I had so many, so many criticals ruined with silvery barbs, and so many bosses that got one-shotted with Tasha's hideous laughter, but I started having to go, okay, every single boss I got to put in this game has to either have a legendary reaction or a high wisdom saving throw. Like, and if they don't have a high wisdom saving throw, I'm just going to cheat. Like, this is ridiculous. I got, like, yeah. six bosses taken out because they're laughing on the ground. Yeah. It's such it a just, ridiculous... Yeah. It's, it's, frustra it's a frustrating, like... But it wouldn't be so bad if my players weren't going the games too easy. You know, like, I wouldn't have a problem. Like, I, was, I was like, okay, this is fine. They're having fun. But then afterwards the game, they go, could you guys make it, could you make it harder? 
And I'm like, no, I don't think I can. Like, and then one time I did. I put three dragons in a room. Because I was like, okay, I'm like realistic. I'm like, no, this one dragon's going to get Tasha's hideous laughter. Yeah. So I put two dragons and I was like, it's still not hard enough. This one's going to get Tasha's hideous laughter and my, and my paladin's going to do 90 points of damage on the other one. He did 200 in one hit. 200 points at level 10. He nearly one shot a dragon. I think I even had to cheat on its hit points because he, he, he smited it so hard on a critical. It was just like, okay, it's... I put three dragons in, they all ran from the room. I'm like, this is doable. You guys could totally take three dragons. What are you running away for? I was so frustrated because <laughs> I designed an encounter that's exactly what they asked for, and then they ran away like cowards. I, I got off on a tangent. Shadow Dark, now my players are like, we don't know who we are in this world. You know, because I free I failed to make this this um campaign primer. And establish what a goblin would be in this. I mean, like, I did it a little bit. They have some under, uh, some understanding of it, but it's just like, and, and it's actually one of my best role players is struggling with it because he's trying to figure out why he's in this campaign, mm. and I'm going, yeah, yeah, I, I ah, darn it, I didn't establish why your character's in this campaign well enough, and you're kind of just this towns person who's now on an epic mission. It's like, Ugh. so I'm at a point well, where I'm like, that's we when have the lamplighters come along and hire them all. All right, yeah, that's that's not a bad I, idea. No, but I, I have to do that, something. Ha go ahead, go ahead. Just to be transparent, I pulled that whole idea from Blades in the Dark because it has such a good system for, like, setting you up as a group right out of the gate. And, and I mm. just kind of took that idea. And honestly, I just baked it into what was going to be that West Marches game. But the point being that, like, having a, a through line or a thread that connects everyone, even new characters that come oh. in, is so important to players understanding their place in that campaign, if that makes sense. It does. And yeah, you're giving me you're giving me a semi-necessary tool that I'm missing. It's the gamification aspect of it. Because um right, like the thing that the thing that we have been missing two things. Like one is I want it to be a West Marches campaign because some weeks someone's not there. Right. And like, so on a week when someone's not there, it's like, yeah, okay, they're back at base or whatever. Right. You guys can, we can keep playing in the setting. They're back at base. Um, the, the problem is I haven't written in that through line. So right now it's just my party going from dungeon out into the normal world. And I'm going, so where do you guys think you're going? Right. Like there's, there's like <laughs> yeah. this, this, there's this issue. And then there's the problem of like, because I have them on this mission to like rescue these missing children who are in various places. They go find some, and then, like, one person goes, I'm going to go run the children back to town. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> you know, the party's, you know, like, we're missing two people now. And it's like, there's, there's, some of it's my own fault world crafting, and some of it is that I'm in a system right now that needs a setting, and I'm too new of a dungeon master to have known I needed to build a setting with a coherent structure to it to support the system, because the system is lacking that thing. And and that's what almost immediately appealed to me about Wild Sea. Mm. Uh, and I, I, can, I can recognize right away, Wild Sea is a game system that is solving eight of my ten issues. And the other yeah. two issues I have, I think it might be solving as well. And that's why like, part of me is going like, do we stick in, in Shadow Dark, which my players aren't into. My, my players are not into the Shadow Dark aspect of Shadow Dark, right? Like... Like, I, I, I brought up spiders to them, and I'm like, it's one simple spider. Kill it. Just kill it, guys. Just kill it. And they're like, we want to give it food. <laughs> I'm like, you guys are not playing Shadow Dark. You know, and I'm like, and the thing is, like, I cut this up as bait because I kind of wanted to figure out, like, what are they going to do with the, and I, I picked spider because spiders are gross, right? Yeah. And I'm like, there's no reason for them to try and make friends with this thing. And they're like, <laughs> give it food. We're going to pet it. We're going to try and pet it. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like trying to read the room here and going, these people do not want bone crunching spiders. These people want cuddly, friendly spiders that like make pets and stuff. And I'm like, huh. You know what I mean? Like, okay, so tell me a little bit about your, your Shadow Dark campaign and like, give me an idea of how you're playing it so I can, because I get, I, I strongly get the sense from the people in my comment section that I am totally misrepresenting Shadow Dark mm. to my players. To the point where I am not doing the system justice to them, but at the same time I'm going. I think if I do, my players aren't into the game. Gotcha. You, you, you go ahead. Well, go ahead. Tell me a little bit. So full disclosure, I 
I never got to start my campaign because of the flood hitting our town and you know yeah, that's uh, right that's so, right I'm sorry you mentioned that yeah 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 so I was I was gearing up for it and and I had a premise I sort of set up and honestly I was going to run it as like a West Marcher style where there was a city I just called Bastion and they were going yeah. to go out from Bastion and sort of you know f they it was going to be a sort of rumors based game where they could take rumors and then you know bite onto the hooks and go find the things and you know, meet mm. factions out in the wild who who were surviving. You know, and, and I was going to plug in things like this, the cursed scroll. Was, like was this going to be like a hex crawl where they are discovering the new new hexes as they travel, and like they have yeah. like a fog of war or something? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I like the idea of that. But go, go ahead, keep going. And so, you know, it was going to be a pretty dark, grim game, like Shadow Dark kind of is, and uh, sure. And, and the thought was that, like, this is after, like, a, a ruined civilization where they finally open the gates to Bastion and they're like, let's go out, let's connect to the places that are out there, you know, let's find out what's still out there. And that's mm. kind of, that was kind of the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? In, in writing, you call this the central tension uh, or oh, the, okay. uh, the um, conflict, I guess, like the overlying mm. conflict. And so... Sure. It was just going to be an exploration game, really, where they go out, they mm -hmm. find treasures. I was going to play it very old school. You know, I had a bunch mm -hmm. of OSE modules or adventures. I was going to just plug into different parts of the map and oh, sure, allow, sure. allow them to find things, emergent storytelling, you know, emergent play, mm -hmm. where whatever they choose to do is what's going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. I really wasn't going to plan too far ahead. You know, I didn't want to okay. have like an overarching narrative other than what I just described. Um, I see. but you know, there's no wrong way to play D and D is the thing. Like, uh, if, if there's something your players really enjoy, then maybe like you're saying, shadow dark is a little too dark and gritty for them. And they're wanting something a mm. little more lighthearted. It sounds like, sure. um, and maybe wild sea is that game. Actually, I don't know anything about wild sea. Uh, I've seen it, but I, mm. yeah, I'm not familiar with the mechanics at all, but you know, I, I will say this along with it. There's no game that's going to be all things to all people. You know, mm. you, you're going to have four out of six players that really like Dragon Bane, let's say. And mm -hmm. then these other two are going to go, I don't know, this is too easy. You know, like, mm. I was having fun sure. with Shadow Dark. Or like, you know, this still doesn't have enough bells and whistles for me to make the characters I want to make. And, it, mm. you know, it's, it scratches that itch a little bit. But you, you know what I mean? Like... I, I do because I, I, I've heard people say this, and I I know that this like, there's like there's no there's no one game for everyone. Okay, that's other, true. Other than I, Crown I, and Skull. I mean, that's the game for everybody. I'm just going to endorse. Okay, so it I'm gonna quick. I'm gonna I'm gonna have you. No, I'm gonna have you tell me about that, and then I'm gonna tell you what I've learned about Wild Sea. So we'll exchange some some game information. But at, at the same at the same time, it's like I understand people when they say there's no one game for everyone. They're kind of talking about like no one system that everyone will like, but I guess the pushback I have on that is like there has to be a game that suits your table best. Like, and if you're yeah. willing to look around a little bit, like, okay, maybe it's not kids on bikes and it's not kids on brooms and it's not whatever, but like the moment you touch on, let's say, like one of the free league games, you know, and you get to one of the D6 systems, you might find that your group is a little more stranger things or a little more forgotten lands or forbidden lands or whatever it is. Like, you might find one of those settings and systems that pairs well with everyone to the point where your group is immersed or Im immersed, immersed in your in your setting and system. And like, okay, it wasn't it wasn't um, Dungeons and Dragons for us, and I don't think it is Shadow Dark. But like we've only really tried two systems. The Dragon Bane one we've only done is like one shots. Like we haven't even done it with our full group. M my thought is like, why not keep looking? You know, like like because because okay, if, if if the worst part about keeping looking is that we cut the game off, we start over again, we're making new characters. Like I know we have like a boring session. Why not have a few boring sessions to get into the system where everyone's kind of going, oh this yeah yeah this this is the one we've been looking for. And you you know you, you know what I mean like like there's yeah there there seems to be like this this idea and I get it from both sides the people who find one system and love it only and the people who say explore are both kind of saying there's not one game system for everyone and I'm like 
we should we should look right. I mean, just like look, like like I mean, like what, 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 okay. If there's only five systems, I get it. But there's like a thousand systems, right? Yeah. Okay. If 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 I was to just go off of what my game store has, like okay, there's forty or fifty systems. There's more than that. Like there are pages and pages, and there are like free ones, and and like you, you don't even have to, you can get to, like like um, the worlds without numbers, totally free PDF. Like there's a bunch of these. Like why would I not? try to look like that seems that almost seems like um putting a head in the sand or something right like that yeah, especially no, as a yeah okay, you, good. you know you're talking to the guy whose whole channel premise is that there are all these systems out there and we should talk about them uh you know okay. yeah. I, I i spent most I'm of my to the choir then yeah yeah <laughs> i've spent most of my youtube career just trying out new systems you know ones i would never heard of and people suggest to me things like that and no you're absolutely right i i think you have to find the system that works best for your table. Um, mm -hmm. it, and maybe that does take just playing a lot of one shots and seeing which, you know, which games really light up your players eyes and they're, you, you can just mm -hmm. tell there's excitement building for that system. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, sometimes you get six months into a system like I did with Genesis and I just go, I really don't want to run another session of Genesis. And it, mm -hmm. and now it's dawning on me or whatever. So, it, you mm -hmm. know, all that to say, like, there's two sides to it, you know, like y you can find that system that works really well for most of the players at your table. I don't think you'll find one that works for everyone at your table. I think that's just mm. a fallacy because, you know, everyone comes it's to D&D. &D. Yeah, everyone comes to games like D&D &D for different reasons. You know, you got your, your power mm. gamers, you got your role players, you know, you have people that just they want to theory craft their characters. And if that isn't there, like in Shadow Dark, they get bored because it's like, Every character feels the same to them. So, you know, it, it is a balance. Um, and, and I think you can... The idea of gotten, real quick, the, the idea I've gotten about D&D &D is D&D &D seems to be for a lot of different players, but it's not for DMs. Like, most of the people I've talked to who have started to hate <laughs> Dungeons & Dragons are people who are running the games. But, yeah. like, all the players are like, yeah, it's totally fun. I'd, I'd play this game forever, right? And even DMs are like, sure, I'll play. I just won't run it. Which is interesting yeah. because they designed a system that the people who are most necessary to play the system are not interested in playing it. Yeah. You know, but, but well, uh, sorry. Go ahead. This is me speculating a little bit, but maybe even more so for the 2024 edition. There was a lot of phrasing coming out when they were making announcements about like, these are the rules that are going to frustrate your GMs and things like that. And it was just like, really, well, what are we doing? Uh, I, uh, I don't know if that's ow. the direction we need to be moving in. Um, do you think that's do you think that's intentional? Like maybe they're trying to aim for like the chat GPT GMs or something. Like maybe they're going, let's just get rid of the human element. I think it's a honestly, I think it's probably a marketing scheme. Uh, I think it, it's okay. going to excite your players. They're going to go out and they're going to buy books with more character options, which, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, there are five players to every one GM. So it, it's a smart choice on one in, in one mm -hmm. aspect. But but yeah, to, your, to your point. I do think a lot of burnout happens on the GM side of the screen because they feel like there's nothing they can do to like challenge their players or at least like create creatively. They feel like they've been put in a box, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you mm -hmm. reach a point where you're like, I, you know, with me, I can only tell world ending stories now unless we reset the game, which nobody wants yeah. to do um, because right. they've, they've, we've built up this story in this campaign and how do I pull the plug on it or something? There's just so many mm -hmm. reasons you start to feel burnout as a GM. And there are just some mm -hmm. games that chafe you a little less as a GM, depending on your style, I think. And and just mm -hmm. rules bloat, even, you know, like like we were saying earlier. You know, you're going to reach a point yeah. where you're like, oh, man, what does the Artificer do now? Uh, he's 16th mm -hmm. level, so, like, he can <laughs> literally just pull a nuclear bomb out of his pocket, I guess. <laughs> you know, right. I don't know. No, it, 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 it's so difficult for a for a dungeon master to plan around the the like. It's not just it's not just character possibilities. It's like you gotta you gotta know every single magic item you've given them. You have to anticipate all the unique interactions of those magic items with other magic items. And it's like, huh? You know, like you create a scenario and then like, sorry, my hat solves the problem to this thing. And you're like, ah, I forgot about that stupid hat, right? Yeah, it does. Okay. <laughs> Session over, guys. Popcorn. Let's, let's, we're done, right? That's, that's, or you're then going, 
no, your hat doesn't solve the problem. You know, yeah. and it's like, yeah, oh, that's okay. worse. Yeah. Yes. Right. 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 Yeah, um, no, tell me no, about it, to, go, go to your point really quick. Um, go ahead. the light cantrip, right? Like that's the perfect example in a mm -hmm. game like shadow dark. If you just had a light cantrip that you knew worked every time, like in 5e, you never fail mm -hmm. at casting light. You do it every yeah. time. Why do we have torches? Why is every sure. dungeon in the world not just full of like, you know, scrolls of light cantrips, you know, right. whatever. Uh, so it just starts to take right. away ways to challenge your players by the more sure. options that they have, <laughs> which, you know, it's fun to have options. But at the same time, like, what kind of story are you wanting to tell, you know? They're they're also a bit undoing themselves with like their sense of I don't even know how to approach it, but like I saw this thing where there's like, you know, dungeons with for wheelchairs and stuff. And I'm like, okay, I understand the intention behind this. Like I understand what you're aiming for, but you've undone my sense of reason in this world with that. Like this is a world where anyone can be healed back from like a molecule of mm. destruction, right? You That's have a spell that can cure a human from disintegration or something. Why would anyone ever be in a wheelchair? Like, I just, and especially like a player character. Like, so in some ways, their desire to be inclusive, which I understand, has destroyed some of their world building, which I'm like, fine, just, just take out the heal spell. This is a perfect opportunity for you guys to take out a perfect heal spell. But you can't have both things, unfortunately. And the fact that they yeah. want to have both things tells me that, there, that there's an incongruency in, like, this is a game that feels wholly made by committee, mm. right? Like, this is this is something where, like, the left hand and the right hand are not talking to each other, and they went, we added some wheelchairs, and like, you know, we have spells that cure wheelchairs. <laughs> and I'm like, ah. So, yeah, it, yeah, either, the, either restoration is a part of the game or it isn't, right? Like, I yeah. see what you're saying. Right. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to just dog on 5e the whole time. It, nah, I know. Yeah, I want to get. I want to get to Crown and Skull because I could dog on five D five E all day. That's not my point. Like, I'm yeah. not trying to be content with people who like five E. If you like five E, enjoy five E. Right. Yeah. I hated running it, but I would play it. If someone was like, "Look, I want to play it with you on Discord," I'm sure I'll make a character. You know, I don't ever want to run it because it's not fun to run. And, but and just to to you know to answer or reply to your point there, yeah, yeah. I I kind of am in the boat now where I'm feeling that like the designers are barely in charge of what's happening anymore it, sure. within that game and i think that's really mm. unfortunate i think they're they're doing the best they can to hold on to the steering wheel and then the marketing team is just kind of like telling them they need to make certain mm. kinds of books and stuff but you sure. know i won't go into all that that's kind of my own theory if you will but yeah anyways it, it's I yeah i could talk I about 5e but you it's know. the same problem that you get in the AAA video game space oh, yeah. where you have a company that goes, so we made a successful football game two years ago, and then the, the investors go, so make it again. And they're mm. like, yeah, well, we could try some new stuff. And they're like, yeah, but new stuff is risky. Successful stuff two years ago is what we want you to do. And it's like at some point you have investors who know nothing about games telling you how to make games. And then over here in the AAA or in the AA and independent game department, you have wholly unique ideas that are like cutting edge and all these giant massive companies are like, so we're just going to sell you all the pieces of last year's game. Are you okay with that? It's like, and, and also and it needs a battle like, no. pass. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It needs a battle pass. There's <laughs> going to be microtransactions up the butt. Like, and, and that's where it feels like some of these larger companies in the tabletop games and war games departments are going, which coming from video games, I'm like, Ooh, I recognize this pattern of game making. This seems wholly antithetical to good customer relationship mm. you know and you know so that's i think that's why i've leaned towards some of the smaller companies that's one of that's like one of the reasons where i've gone like hey what's free league doing you know yeah. hey what's what MythWorks doing i'm go tell me about crown and skull i know nothing about crown and skull give me the give me the elevator pitch and whatever else you want to tell me about it well it i probably have a little bit more time but i, I wanted to say you know just to your point about sort of the okay. company that Wizards of the Coast is becoming, you know, because it is sure. a company at the end of the day. Right. It's, it's the reason, similar to what you're saying about video games, that I started to lean more towards companies like Free League or even Runehammer Games because they're mm -hmm. trying such 
innovative things that are really breaking the mold. They're not just trying mm -hmm. to stick right in there and do what's always been done. They're, they're really sure. reaching for fresh ideas and new takes on, like even with Wild Seed, sounds like there's some really interesting ideas for reasons for things to happen within that game that are kind of sure. helping your GMs along so that they're not just going, what do I do about reasons these characters are in? But anyways, to, right. to, right. to maybe talk about this game for just a second. Um, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. One of the things I've really appreciated about it, I got to play in something called Rune Jammer, which was like an online con. And uh, I, I was really liking how it was this mixture of things like Dragon Bane with the roll under system of skills. Mm -hmm but then reminded me of like a lot of old school sensibilities, like characters were still pretty squishy, you know, like I was playing a wizard that I didn't have a lot of options, honestly, like the, the warrior in our game saved my life over and over with his one special ability he had, where he could interject his shield before I got hit and stuff like that. But okay, so here's an example of one of the things that's really innovative and cool about it. It is a slot based inventory system and spells or abilities, but those are your hit points. So when you get hit, oh, you, you start okay. marking off abilities or equipment. So that's it's called an attrition system. So instead like of taking, Nate? um, does that happen in Nave? Or, I think you still have hit points. Nave has a, a Nave has a system where you put wounds into your inventory, or maybe I'm thinking of Mouse Reader. Mouse Reader, Cairn, oh, yeah. I think might be. One of them is inventory based that does that similar thing. So, okay, keep going. So you, you, so when you take damage, what, what, what happens? You lose an inventory slot. Yeah. And, and different kinds of monsters might deal specifically like equipment damage, or they might deal things to just abilities. And they might have like a random role where you don't get to choose what goes away. And then sometimes mm -hmm. it's, it's like destroy equipment. So it's not just like it's marked off mm -hmm. for a few combats. That sword is gone. You got to go buy a new oh. one. Um, wow. So, okay. So, it has a lot of like really simple mechanics, but then on the player side of things, the customization is insane. Like mm. you can literally craft spells from scratch. You can choose how many <laughs> dice they deal. You can choose whether they hit multiple targets. Then in order to, and it's all point based, like you spend points to do them. So in order okay. to gain more points to make your spell more interesting, you can also take, um, not impediments, what is it called? Um, limitations to that spell for instance so you might say mm. this can only ever hit one target but now i get three more points to spin and it does an extra dice of damage or something like that mm. so okay i think it's a so good you can game customize the output while you're playing it too not just in the on the character end but you can like adjust your spell as you're casting it to some degree um i know i think you do have to set it ahead of time there might be some okay. spells that are a little more in flux okay. like that um mm -hmm. okay but point being that like so you you mentioned having some players that just felt like they couldn't express express themselves through the mechanics like all the characters in shadow dark felt the same right like at the sure. end of the day you were a fighter who's a fighter who's a fighter um there you go. yeah in this game you might have a fighter who's fighting with a two-handed weapon and gets to swing to die and take the better or something like that because that's the ability mm -hmm. you chose in character creation you wanted to focus on damage output while the guy who kept saving my wizard's life his ability was that he could interject his shield like once around and save mm -hmm. me from taking damage and took it to his shield instead so there was lots sure. of ways to express yourself through that customization but it still had a lot of those old school sensibilities where you weren't just always rolling dice to see what happens mm -hmm. you know you're still role playing you're still making smart choices instead of just trying to get into a fight every time, like 5e or something. So mm. I felt like it was this good balance, this good middle ground of a game for players who still enjoy theory crafting or building and expressing themselves, but for GMs who didn't want to, you know, play 5e or something like that, where it's just like, mm. you know, really complex enemies that you're running. Because, you know, uh, we fought a roper. I don't know if you've ever had okay. one of those in your game. It's like the big... No, no. It's like a stalagmite that's come to life and has a bunch of tentacles. Oh, it, yeah, it, yeah. It was like the scariest fight in the entire thing that we played because he was pulling us in, and his ability was if he pulls you in and gets you to him, he destroys all your equipment in one round. Oh, and so we were okay, like, wow. Those stakes are high. You're yeah. Just, you're pretty much dead next hit. 
you know. And you and you guys knew that that was going to happen. Like, there's no there's no like surprise. It's like, hey, by the way, the DM is like, okay, by the way, if he gets you, your equipment's done. And honestly, okay. I don't remember if he just told us that to like raise the stakes or if we found it out because someone made a knowledge roll or something. Okay. But I just okay, remember yeah, yeah. we were aware of that, sure. and so we were like. Okay, well, the fighter yeah. is in his grasp right now. We need to get him out of that tentacle this oh, round because hey. it, it triggers wow. at the end of the round. Like, yeah. So, so, so you guys, as the players, now during the fight, have a significant amount of agency, or, or at least um, you can make a smart decision about agency. That's that's cool. Having having fight agency is good. Hmm. I feel like I feel like that system is really interesting. But I think my table is a little too like, we're going to go pick flowers here. We're going to, you know, and some of that might be the way I run games. And maybe I just, I don't know, like, I'm thinking about it. And I'm like, man, I'd have two people that wouldn't be pulling that fighter out of there. <laughs> and, then, and then the fighter would be pissed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know what you mean. That's, that sounds really fun. I would love to play that. I don't know if I'd run love to run that because, I, again, I think I have a table of people that is a little bit loosey-goosey with, What's going on? And it means I would have to have a punishing game system, like, or I'd have to have one punishing um, session, mm. right? And then, and then everyone would learn. But uh, you yeah. know what I mean, like, and, like, and that's where I just keep coming back to: no game is going to be all things to all people. You know, you you, yeah. you you might be right about Wild Sea, and you might have a good intuition about your group, and maybe there's mm. a, a good middle ground there where there's some character customization, but then also like that fun kind of zany flavor to it it sounds like sure. um sure. so you know find the one that works best for you i i just always end up pitching this game because i think it's really cool and nobody talks so, about it but it uh, sounds really fun and, and I, okay so why would so it sounds like you were ready to start a campaign in shadow dark mm. have you already run a campaign in crown and skull and like you want to try shadow dark or like why would you choose shadow dark over that system since you already kind of know that system and it's interesting to you uh, mostly because it's kind of like what I have available to me is my, mm -hmm. I found a bunch of my, uh, old school essentials games in the trunk and I had bought them mm -hmm. before when I was gearing up to do shadow dark, but, um, I really just wanted some things I could plug and play where I didn't have to write adventures. I didn't have to like <laughs> do a majority of the work on the GM side of the screen. Uh, sure. I just, I just wanted something really simple cause you know, we have a 16 month old, she takes up a lot of my time and attention right now. And, and I really mm -hmm. just wanted to, yeah, yeah, grab adventures, plug them in. And I have a lot of DCC ones too, which I actually think would be pretty close in sort of like a power level or like math for Shadow Dark. So basically it was just resources available to me was the main decision. Okay. And, and then sure. Shadow Dark is close enough to games like 5e as far as like basic mechanics that I thought a lot of my players would probably be on board with that. Although I did, mm. I, I ended up sending out a wider net to people in my area that wanted to play. So I don't even know some of them because it was going to be West marches in the true sense where like whoever mm. shows up gets to play and there are no mm -hmm. set groups and stuff like that. Um, whatever happens mm. that session happens and then is done with. And then, you know, okay. next time we'll see who shows up. But yeah. Hmm. That's uh, an also, interesting... Okay. I, I was just gonna say. Also, this this feels like you're gonna put a decent amount of time into character creation, and Shadow Dark mm -hmm. is like you just roll it in two minutes and you got a new character. So, yeah, the, the, uh, this Crown and Skull game does it give you the idea like your your character is gonna die quickly or potentially gonna die quickly? Like, is it is it a pretty punishing system? I would say it probably depends on your GM. Um, mm -hmm. That guy was probably fairly lenient to let us know what was about to happen with that roper. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. But that could have been a situation where we had a character death right out of the gate. Like that was one of the first fights we had. So okay, it, it seems hey. like in, in the way you can kind of put your, your finger on the scale in games like 5e by like mm -hmm. adding a few extra monsters or even just like, yeah, I mean, so I'd have to explain phases to really make it sure, make sense on. to you. But okay, it's... Okay, it, it, now I feel like I'm just pitching Crown and Skull, but um, you should pitch, pitch Crown and Skull. I, I I'm probably going to try and find this book. Like I, I'm interested in learning. I don't say all the systems, but a lot. You know, to to get an idea. So yeah, pitch it. Go ahead. So 
there's like a bar that we had at the top of our game because we're playing online. And there are essentially five phases in a combat. And everyone just decides at the beginning, okay, I want to go on phase one. I want to go on phase two, three, four, five. And so mm -hmm. five is the end of the round. So a lot of times your cleric wants to go on like five because mm. if someone gets downed and they reach the end of the round before they're healed, that person's just dead. If, and the oh, cleric wow. can heal them on the fifth round. So it might not always be yeah. good for your cleric to go first, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. So, 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 so you might have a fighter going first, but then there'll also be a monster who's in phase one with that fighter. And then there'll be a monster in phase three and a monster in phase four and possibly a monster in phase five as well. So the cleric wants to go as last as possible to pick up anyone who's been downed. Because if phase five ends and a player is down, they're dead. Yeah. That's okay. I love it already. That's, I mean, yeah. that's, I mean, I, I kind of hate the death save thing because it makes everything so like, oh, you know, like, like there's players at my table who are just going, they'll be fine, right? This person will be fine. Yeah. They're going to be rolling death save. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 oh, who, like, well, I'll come back and get them in a moment, right? It would make me as the GM have to go, I could have growled them. I could have growled them. Oh, they're dead, right? Like, I have to actually take a wasteful action. But I, I kind of would prefer to play in a game system where the, my players know exactly what death means and when it will come. And, 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 interesting. And just to clear up, some monsters just go on specific phases. Like the Roper, mm. he was a elite monster or whatever, so he went on one and five. On one, mm. he would grab you. On five, he would eat you. Hate you. Okay. Wow, so that's cool. Their attacks oh. worked based on their stat block. It would tell you what phase they attack and stuff like that. I see. So. And that's all in the book, or do you have to get like a, comp a compendium to run the monsters? It's one book. This thing's pretty thick. It's about four hundred yeah. pages. You got uh, pictures? Three forty-one. Huh? Does it have pictures? Uh, like of the monsters? Like if you get into the monsters, does it show you like a picture of like what, what a roper looks like or something? Or not really there there's some art in the center of the book that's pretty interesting i think it's a it's more just to like give you the tone and style of the game i'm gonna just show it oh off yeah yeah hey, cool. but yeah. Um, i'm actually like gaston yeah, looking at one of these things like how can you read this there's no pictures <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean I love oh that's cool looking there's there's art what's but, you the, know. what is this what is the setting of the of the game wow that's cool what, what's the setting um it's definitely fantasy, but you know there are like flintlock pistols and stuff. Um, mm, okay. And it it so another really interesting thing about the book is that there are a lot of like regions built into it, and even like in character creation, you can say like, you know, I'm from the I can't even remember the names of them, like the Slime Rock region, Slime Rock yeah, Village, yeah. and and you know that might mean you're well, more that... you're more of yeah, like. Yeah. In a western sort of frontier town or something like that, oh, where, okay. where you're okay. not like connected to a hub city, you're sort of a sure. outlander, that kind of stuff. And and there you're are like lots... a hillbilly. Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. And, sure. and there okay. are even like really interesting ways of rolling up information. Like if you want to make a town and you're like, okay, well I know it's going to be a, a frozen tundra region. Well, I'll go to that table mm. and I'll roll a couple of dice and see what's there. And you can quickly mm. populate it without like, yeah, it, it's got a ton of GM resources. They're just mm. really good. Um, Easy to use. It's all in one book too. Like there's monsters okay. in there. So you don't have to go around and buy a, a DMG, a player's handbook and a, you know, whatever basic right. rules. Right. So That's, that's pretty cool. That, I, that, that is a very interesting system to me for a number of reasons. I like this Shadow Dark thing, but the thing I've been sensing about it that I that I dislike or I'm uncertain about is the setting thing. And being a new dungeon master, like again, I saw this dude's four page thing, and I'm basically like, I'm telling the guy, like, I'm just gonna copy this. Like I'm just going to grab this, use it as a template, and paste a bunch of my own information in, and that might help me establish my setting a little bit to help my players. But this yeah, this game sounds interesting. Yeah, it's, I, it's I I really Go, 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 go. I was just going to say, it's really unique, and that's what I've liked about it. Um, a lot of games start feeling like a little samey with like a, just a slight genre twist on them, whereas this just felt sure. like a, a lot of fresh ideas that I was really enjoying. So, mm. Yeah, I'm interested to take a look at it now, because the other thing I have to kind of keep in, in mind is my son 
when he's playing, he really likes to craft a character. And Shadow Dark's a difficult game to craft a character because it's like, well, you leveled up, just roll a dice. There you go, you got a plus two. Oh, there you go, you got a, you know, you can use your ability again. Even in the spells, like I played in a game with him yesterday and I made a wizard, and I was having a hard time connecting my spells to each other. Like, there was not really a way I could go, I cast this thing and then follow it up with this thing that responds to the first thing. Like, I couldn't find a single thing between, like, tier one and tier two spells that linked my character's abilities tier one to tier two. Like, Dragon, Dragon Bane already had that, where it's like, if you pick this spell, then you can pick this spell. And mm, if you sort don't of like pick a this spell... like a school or whatever in D&D? Yeah, essentially, yeah, yeah. So there's three different schools, and then within three different schools, like, you have chains of, like, for example, the Elementalist. The Elementalist can go, and on level one, they can pick three different spells. So you could go, I can pick... Uh, pillar, which summons a rock out from underneath someone. I can pick the fireball, and I can pick frost. And um, then once I get started getting like more spells, I can pick um, the tier two version of frost that freezes like a specific target. Then I can, if I've picked fireball enough times plus a uh, hurricane, like gust and hurricane, I can create a firestorm. And yeah. so right away you can start seeing how like, but if you don't have hurricane and uh, fire, uh, fireball, like the highest level of fireball, you can't pick Firestorm. And so there's already like a way you can see, like I, I, I could pass my character in an interesting way. And there were unique designs of characters. Like for example, you could make a summoner who could make permanent pets, but you had to take a bunch of useless stuff early on. And then eventually yeah. you could actually take, you could make pets. Like you could summon this fire, fire lizard and make it a permanent enchantment, but it's going to take your maximum willpower down by one, which is like your, your, your mana essentially. And I was like, that's interesting. Like this is a person who like every so often is summoning up a brand new lizard. They could have like three or four lizards, but they've lowered their cap willpower down like that. That was, that was cool. So, yeah. and this, this system you're, you're, you're talking about sounds also unique in the character building. Yeah, no, I, I love Dragon Bane too. I, I think actually it's a really great game if you want to like sort of transition your players away from 5e. Because it's still got sure. enough of the action kind of feel to it, but right. you know, everyone on both sides of the fence are dealing a lot of damage, so there's still some deadliness right. to it. But, but yeah, no, yeah. It, it it does have a little bit more of those building blocks and places that you're talking about, like you know, mm -hmm. things like magic schools and and ways to you know, like look forward to things that you're going to gain down the road, mm -hmm. that, that kind right. of stuff. So yeah, so yeah I, I, I love that you play Dragon Bane. I'm like telling it, telling you about it as though you've never heard of it or something. Now you get. It's just, it's just, I got really excited about that system because it it had a cool way of building characters, yeah, you know? Yeah. And, and I thought it was even a little more interesting than 5th edition because of the narrowing of the scope. Mm -hmm. Like, 5th edition was a little bit too, like, oh, I can just do anything. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, it's, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I, I really uh, enjoy Drag Man. I, especially things like a roll-under system. I, I just love that I don't have to ever set a DC as a GM. You know, that's one of my right. favorite things. It's like either you, you do it because you put a lot of points into that skill or gained a lot of points in it, or you don't. And I don't have to decide right. it's a hard challenge or whatever. I, you know, I, I think those are innovations that we're going to see more of as games come out. I, I think those. You think really, so? Yeah, I think that's a positive change to the, the hobby. That's just less mm -hmm. weight on the GM and less like right. feeling of unfairness, if that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'm making this a DC 20, and you're like, why? Right. You know? Or, yeah, right, where the, where the DM has to, like, a, has to arbitrarily put in a difficulty thing or something, and it's like, no, you pick, you wanted to hit it with your axe. You didn't, you didn't get it. Sorry. You know, it's like, that didn't work. So, and you could still do uh, that to some that. extent by saying, like, you just have a disadvantage on this, I guess. But I, I would do that very seldomly in a game like Dragon Bane, so. Sure. Right. But, and Dragon Bane is also one of those systems where it's really easy for the players to unite together to go, we help them, we help them, we help them. Three boons, you guys, you're going to get it, right? So it's yeah. like, and, and, and um, yeah, and, and I think I even playing it was probably leaning a little too heavily into the role because I got the sense it's like, oh, your players can level up more the more times you give them the chance to roll. Mm -hmm. And I probably, if I was to go to it again, I would go, if you're not in a fight, you're not rolling. You know, if you're not if you're not hanging from a ledge, you're not rolling. There's no reason to have me roll for you to get out of this cage just because you could roll a twenty or a one. 
So, yeah. But I, I remember at the beginning of this, you told me that you might have a time limit. I have no idea how long we've been talking. Yeah, I'm probably coming up on it right now, actually. I, th I think I'm actually past it, but... Okay. We, we've had such good conversations. I didn't want to cut you off anywhere. I, you know, I was enjoying, you know, everything we were putting forth. So, I, I am as well. I, this this was this was fun. I, I enjoyed having a, a talk with Ticking Time Bob about uh, the Pen Dragon system, and I've enjoyed talking with you about all, all your your experience with with games and all the different things that you've you've learned from gaming, and uh, and as well, kind of getting an understanding or a little better understanding of what tabletop games are to you like in your current situation um so that's yeah that's 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 been really interesting to to, to hear from you about that yeah well, so thanks. i mean yeah no th thank you for thank you for for sharing with me um yeah and, i'm gonna i'm gonna I, go found, I was gonna say i found your channel a while back uh just was enjoying your journey through you know figuring out what games you wanted to play or run or what games your your table was enjoying and uh i was gonna say if people want to find you you know what's you what's your actual I'll, you know i'll probably put this in the description but <laughs> yeah. what, what is your actual I, channel name so they know <laughs> it says tabletop family okay and uh and the reason i have difficulty remembering it is because initially i wanted to call it family tabletop but i'd already changed my name in that week and it's like you have to wait 14 days so i'm like i'm just leaving it i, I don't yeah. care tabletop family ttf there we go tabletop family okay yeah yeah you got anything coming up or going on with your channel that you want to talk about or um yeah man, that's a good question um well yeah one of the things that i was going to focus on was i was going to make a video about this this campaign primer because it's one of the things where it's like this dude made a four-page document that essentially solved my issue with being in a agnostic setting but then the thing i thought was like so I might want to go into Wild Sea. And, and that, I've been teetering back and forth about Wild Sea for a while. But I think a campaign primer would be good in Wild Sea as well. Like, like this idea is something where I'm like, actually, no matter what game you're playing in, I think this little four-page document is super helpful to have. And this, this dude who made it was like, yeah, whatever, just give it away. I don't care. I get, I don't, don't link my social or anything. I, just, I don't care. You can have it. I was like, yeah. okay, you're sure. Because it was like it was like a really good like just template for how to make a a sort of believable diegetic world for your players to kind of go we know who some of the factions are we know that the king is a snot nosed brat like we we understand some of the stuff about the world and now we can make a character in it so yeah. uh that's 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 like yeah a lot of the things i make for videos it's just random and sporadic like someone suggests something and i was like oh, i didn't even know that was a thing you know so yeah well, so lots today of people have those kinds yeah. of questions so it's great Sure. Yeah. I've appreciated watching your videos as well, especially the things where you're talking about your favorite systems. So, have you have you made a video talking all about Crown and Skull that I, that I can go watch? Yeah, there's one up on the channel. Okay. Um, it's got like an orangish kind of thumbnail, but I I think it's just like this is the game to get your players break your players. I think from Five E is how I phrase it or something. Okay. Thumbnail, but, all right. Yeah. I'll look for that. I'll yeah, look for that. We can, we, can, we can have another one of these talks sometime? Yeah, for sure. I, I want to... So I think this is going up on my channel, if I remember right. And yeah, yeah. Just put, it, put it on your channel. I Until I can get my stupid Discord working and, like, get the audio to come through, like, I'm just going to put it on your channel and, and you know, and... and uh, the, well, one, you can test out our, if your viewers are interested in long-form content, right? Yeah, and I was going to say, if you've made it this far into this video, leave a comment and yep. let me know if you enjoy these like longer-form contents with yes. your guests. Um, yeah. it, it would be nice to do more of these in the future if you guys enjoy this sure. kind of thing. I know we probably rambled for two hours at this point or something, but... Is um, it been that long? Have we been talking about two hours? I don't know, actually, because we were doing some testing before, but I didn't really... That's right, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so right. hopefully it's something that people enjoy. And if so, I'll keep making more of these and, you know, I can come on your channel and we can do another one. So that sounds fun. That sounds awesome. I'll make a, I'll make a couple shorts just to, to, to link over to this. Once you have it posted, I'll put like a direct link to it. If I, if I can, I think I can. And then, yeah, maybe, maybe we can have another chat uh, soon. Um, and you know what, potentially, uh, this is something I've been trying to to do with people. Like the the guy the guy ticking time Bob is gonna try and set up a pen dragon game for me, and I'm gonna try and find a few people to jump in and play, like just on Discord or something. If you're interested in running a Crown and Skull game, I would love to play. Yeah, so if you'd be yeah. interested, in, like, like 
getting one going. I know, I know your, your life is hectic and your schedule is like back and forth, but like, let's say in the next couple weeks or something, things settle down. If it's something you could do, um, uh, consider me interested. Okay. Yeah. As soon as, as soon as my life equalizes a little more, I'm definitely down for go. that. So huh? yeah. Cool. All right. Well, let's, let's probably end That's the video good. there. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Well, cut it off and then we can, we can say goodbye after that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So thanks everybody yeah. for watching, you know, all the usual Thank stuff. You for watching. Um, go yep. check out Nate's channel. It's awesome. And okay. that's it. All right. Goodbye. God bless you.